thank you very much, Lady Boothroyd, and uh, it is an honour to serve under your chairmanship, and I do so with a great sense of trepidation. I'm sure some of my illustrious colleagues who served under your speakership would um, endorse that. <laughs> Firstly, can I just say how inspiring it was to hear the Colonel talk, because for many of us, we've seen the videos, we've had the messages, some of you with friends and relatives in Ashraf have had direct contact, but we heard from this gentleman as it is, as it was. We've heard about the quality and the stature of the people of the PMOI, we've heard about the stature of the people in Camp Ashraf and why we have to continue this great crusade. And uh, I want to turn the clock back a little bit to the meeting we had just before Christmas when we had heard about ridiculous, unlawful and potentially dangerous timetables inflicted on the people of Ashraf by the Iraqi government. And some of us left that meeting with a sense of fear and anxiety and worry. We didn't know what was coming next. Can I quote from you from that memorandum of understanding? The MOU is a good start. It outlines the process of relocation to Camp Liberty, which will take place exclusively under the security responsibility of the Government of the Republic of Iraq. That the Government of the Republic of Iraq ensures your safety and security both during the transportation from Camp Ashraf to Camp Liberty and in Camp Liberty itself until the time comes when you leave Iraq. Safe and secure transfer of the residents of Camp Ashraf to Camp Liberty and from Camp Liberty to other countries is ensured. Upon arrival of the residents to Camp Liberty, the United Nations will conduct 24-7, what a terrible phrase that is, but nonetheless, 24-7 monitoring at Camp Liberty until the residents leave Iraq. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a believer in good, old-fashioned trust. And manifestly, by their record in the history of Camp Ashraf, Mr. Maliki and his colleagues are not for trusting. Compare those sentiments, compare those sentiments with the breaches that have been perpetrated against the people of Camp Ashraf. The three separate rocket attacks that David Amos talked about. The denial of kerosene for cooking and heating. In the winter cold, the denial of any energy forms to keep the people of Camp Ashraf warm. The denial of life-saving medical treatment. Medical treatment requires sometimes for natural occurrences, but all too often because of the violence and aggression perpetrated by Iraqi forces. The area allocated to the residents of Camp Ashraf, one square kilometre for 3,400 people. A camp lacking the basic elementary necessities. A camp unsuitable for women, let alone any human being. A camp lacking electricity, water supply and basic sewerage. A camp lacking any open space. A camp susceptible to the agents of the Iranian uh, that Iraqi regime. A camp generously, generously provided by the Iraqi government. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a matter of trust. It is a matter of trust that the Iraqi government have failed. And so, once again, we in this movement, as Lord Clark has always said, and he's one of my inspiring figures in this movement, because I've only been in this for a few years, and he's been at it with Lord Corbett and Lord Boddington and uh, Lord Archer and the others for many, many, many years. He is right, what he said about the need to bring awareness. And I want the message of the Colonel to go to the Foreign Office here, and indeed the State Department 
in America because you said you crystallised so much of what many of us have said and thought and tried to argue over the years but we must remember we must continue to remind the United Nations in this cobbled together completely unsatisfactory arrangement we must remember that the silence against those humanitarian breaches is simply not good enough silence is complicity silence is facilitation silence is permission and that is the position of our friends in Ashraf and Liberty today